Chapter 4 Flowey The same place, the same thing. Frisk remembered how the first time he had entered Asgore's house, the similarity had struck him so that he'd hesitantly called for Toriel. The doorways, the carpets, every stick of furniture the same. Only on closer examination had he seen the disparities. The scuff marks on the carpet from small, careless feet. The gouges on the door frames from where someone with very sharp horns had forgotten to duck. The books on the shelves covered in patinas of dust. The reading chair whose seat was stiff and cracked. The color of the light, the lingering melancholy air, and the monsters. He remembered how confused he'd been at seeing them all in this house. They'd croaked quietly on seat cushions, buzzed on high shelves, gently jiggled on end tables and in corners. None of them had acknowledged him. He crept around feeling like an intruder. In a sense, that's what he had been. Now he stepped into the house and shut the door behind him. He made his way to the right and down the hall and into the first room on the left. He remembered how he'd finally shaken off his déjà vu in this room, how the twin beds and different toys had convinced him that no, this wasn't where he had been before, and Toriel wouldn't come no matter how loud he called. One bed surrounded by dusty toys, their blank, button eyes staring off into space. The other one undecorated and bare, the air around it oddly cold. The two unopened boxes lay on the floor. He remembered that one held a heart-shaped locket, and that wearing it had somehow made him feel safer, given him the determination to make it through the fights ahead. He had left the locket untouched every time after that. It didn't belong to him. Instead, he bent over the other box and opened it. He removed the knife he found there, its blade nicked and mottled with rust. He held it up to the light. He tested its weight. Then he left the room and approached the key on the far side of the hall. He remembered that this is where they would speak, and so on cue, the monsters raised their heads. A long time ago, a human fell into the ruins. Injured by its fall, the human called for help. He remembered the first time he had fallen, lying there breathless among the flowers, staring up at the circle of sunlight, unsure of whether he could get up or whether he even should. He took the key and returned the way he came. He avoided looking in the mirror. He felt the monster's gazes on his back. Asriel, the king's son, heard the human's call. He brought the human back to the castle. He remembered that this was the first time he'd heard that name. He stepped into the kitchen and took the second key. He pulled open the door to the oven and saw the empty pie tin that lay there. He went back into the living room. He avoided looking at the golden flowers. Over time... Asriel and the human became like siblings. The king and queen treated the human child as their own. The underground was full of hope. He remembered seeing Asriel for the first time, and how his face had lit up when he called out that unfamiliar name. How he had done the same later, with his body warped and surging with power, the unlocked souls surging with white light from every seam. How he drowned Frisk in searing light until it had felt as though his skin would peel away and leave his soul bare, howling all the while for someone Frisk wasn't, begging for him not to leave. Frisk unlocked the chains, blocking the staircase, and descended. The knife's handle was cold against his palm. He reached the bottom step and stared into the hall beyond. It was thronged with monsters against both sides, all shapes and sizes. Every one he'd met, and then some— all silent, averting their eyes, or equivalent of eyes. They felt like the crowd for a funeral procession. In a sense, that's what they were. He took a deep breath and kept walking. Then, one day, the human became very ill. The tapes in the laboratory depths, dark words sealed within sticky cases, the trembling in Azriel's voice as he promised to fetch the flowers. The sick human had only one request, to see the flowers from their village, but there was nothing we could do. The flowers bending in the breeze, the scent of sweet lemons. The next day, the human died. The flower patch in the ruins, its earth soft and welcoming, the half-open coffin in the basement filled only with darkness, 
Toriel standing over the flowers with her palms clasped and her head bowed low. Azriel standing in the same place, in the same position, before he'd sensed Frisk approaching. Frisk and Azriel speaking there, and how Azriel would sometimes half-consciously place one hand on the earth as he talked, as if lulling the ground back to sleep. The monsters unspooled their history as Frisk walked among them. Explanation and apology in one. The cause of their regret and why he had to die. As he stepped out of the hall and onto the bridge leading to the castle, he found himself flanked by the carved metropolis of New Home, where everyone who had watched Metaton's last hurrah had stepped away from their televisions and taken to the windows, the rooftops, the streets, innumerable gazes pressed down on him like weight. The monsters on the bridge continued their story, each picking up where the previous had left off, their souls resonating with the bitter nostalgia. Though every face was different, and some barely had a face at all, Frisk could make out something, their expressions all shared. Maybe gratitude? Maybe relief? He remembered that this was where he had cried for the first time in a long time. He'd been frightened of his own tears. He hadn't been sure what was causing them, or how to make them stop. Now, his step did not falter. He silently mouthed each word as it was spoken. With each swing of his arm... Light winked off the knife's blade. It's not long now. King Asgore will let us go. King Asgore will give us hope. King Asgore will save us all. He remembered Asgore's face when they had first met, that uneasy mix of resolution and resignation, the look of someone who had found himself hopelessly trapped in the machinery of his own choices. He understood that face a little better every time they met, you should be smiling, too. Aren't you happy? Aren't you excited? He remembered that this was when the final froggit would leap out of the parapet and land at his feet. The way it would turn its head up to look at him, the first monster to meet his eyes since he'd entered the house. The faint, desperate reassurance in its voice when it told him, You're going to be free. And he was filled with determination. The antechamber beyond, where the delta rune was tattooed on the far wall in stained glass and the shadows of the columns cross-hatched the ground like prison bars. Frisk passed through the alternating darkness. He saw the figure standing there at the far end, its hands nested in its hoodie pockets. Sans was always around for this, no matter where he had been or whatever dead ends his latest attempt had sent him to. They would meet in this hall. Time after time he would appear. As Frisk approached, Sans's pupils shone, the only points of light in his silhouetted frame. Frisk felt the gaze bore into him. Then, those two bright spots swiveled down to the knife clutched in his hand. They remained fixed there for a long time. Sans turned on his heel and walked off. Despite everything, he said, it's still you. He stepped under the shadow of a column and did not emerge again. The only proof he'd ever been there was the echo of his footsteps already fading away. The same place, the same thing. The cavern that held the barrier was unutterably vast. Maybe it was a trick of the light. Maybe the pulsating wall warped the twilight that seeped through it, altering the cave's dimensions but to Frisk it seemed like it could hold every monster in the underground with room left over. He wouldn't have been surprised to learn that the entirety of Mount Ebbet was hollow, and this was its interior. The barrier's size must have only worsened the monster's hopelessness. Standing near it, you could feel your skin thrumming from its power. Asgore knelt in front of him, one hand clasped over the gash on his breastplate. The six souls quivered in their jars, emitting that unfinished rainbow of light. After everything I've done to hurt you, he murmured, and even in his low, hurt tone, his voice was so deep that Frisk could feel its rumble in his souls. You would rather stay down here and suffer than live happily on the surface? He remembered every time he died at Asgore's hand, wreathed in flames until he'd felt his soul crack in two, only to wake up again outside the door to the barrier's cavern. The first time he'd been so shocked by the resemblance to Toriel that he hadn't even found it in himself to avoid the king's attacks. 
Then he tried to talk him down again and again, fighting for the words that would raise Asgore's head and make him understand, unable to find them before he was struck down. Finally, he realized that he would have to fight, and then he died again. He'd had no practice actually attacking anyone with his stick. Human, I promise you, for as long as you remain here, my wife and I will take care of you as best we can. Asgore's face had lit up. Frisk wanted to approach him, apologize somehow for what was to come. He knew he had to keep his distance. His grip on the knife tightened. We could be like... like a family. Gleaming white pellets haloed Asgore's kneeling body. Frisk looked away. He heard a single, strangled gasp and the sound of dust sifting to the ground. When he looked up again, he saw the soul, the pure, white light shuddering above Asgore's remains. Then, another pellet drifted cheerfully downward, and struck the light, and shattered it into prisms, falling down, fading out, already gone. And now, here was his best friend. You idiot! You haven't learned a thing! That voice again. High and bright and laced with cheer like cyanide. Buried deep underneath, Frisk could still hear the echo of Azrael. He remembered that this was the first place he'd seen. Deceptive in more ways than one. Normally like a child's sketch. Penciled in eyes, toothless smile. Those lines of black moving seamlessly around the surface like ink rolling on water. But then it would distort like putty, gain dimensions and darkness out of nowhere, and the eyes, already lusterless and black, would crack open and form holes that continued right through the back of its head and into parts unknown. They did so now, as vines burst from the earth, encircled the soul jars, cracked them open like eggs, and the face grew fangs. It seemed to decay. It dripped a vicious, colorless liquid that sizzled when it hit the ground. In this world, Flowey shrieked, it's kill or be killed. Then Frisk stood over Flowey's broken body. He remembered the terror he'd felt the first time. Deliberate, certainly. Every aspect of the experience tailored to sap his will to fight. That momentary feeling of being nowhere at all, floating in empty dark space before he was yanked back to whatever warped facsimile of reality Flowey had created with the stolen souls. Flowey's face, blown up bigger than the core, ranting down at him in a voice that made his bones shudder. The twitching, cackling nightmare that had descended down on him when he'd held his ground. But that had been a long time ago. Flowey was always so entranced by his own power that he never noticed how Frisk's face no longer betrayed a hint of fear, or how his unceasing barrage of incomprehensible attacks were dodged without effort or concentration. The knife really did make things so much easier. This was the only time he was ever able to get so close, and as ever, he was surprised by how small Flowey really was when he wasn't constantly mutating himself. He barely came up halfway to Frisk's knee, with the stem fully extended. And right now he was hunched over, his paddles tattered, his face blackened. The barrier wavered where the human souls had escaped their captivity and burst through to the other side. If Frisk wanted, he could step right through in their wake before the wall solidified once again. Flowey turned his head just enough for his photo-negative eye to be visible. What are you doing? Do you really think I've learned anything from this? He sagged again. No. Frisk stared down at him. Sparing me won't change anything. Even now he could hear the smirk in that voice. Killing me is the only way to end this. Frisk held up the knife. He turned it back and forth in his hands. The dying twilight caught the blade and briefly stained it a bloody red. Flowey turned again. His grin was a pale crescent. He watched the knife rise. I knew you had it in you. And fall. Wait, what? Working quickly, Frisk used the blade of the knife to carve out a circle of earth around Flowey. He sawed through the dirt, levered it loose, and as Flowey's face snapped this way and that, his pencil sketch eyes struggling to keep up, Frisk reached down and scooped up dirt, Flowey and all, 
and held him in the palm of his hand. What do you think you're doing? Flowey's scarred, smudged face turned up to his, gnashing its teeth. You can't do this! You can't do this! Frisk turned and walked away from the barrier. Hey, I'm talking to you! You think I'm just going to stand here and take it? He summoned up all his remaining power and attacked. This resulted in a single white pellet drifting down towards Frisk's head like a sad snowflake. Frisk didn't even have to dodge. His leisurely stroll was enough to avoid it. Flowey stared, then thrashed inside the clod of earth to little avail. Do you even care about the barrier, you idiot? It's going to close up again any second now, and then... His mouth turned toothy. You'll be stuck down here with me, and I'll make you pay for this. I'll kill you. I'll kill everyone. I'll kill everyone you... Frisk looked down at him and put a finger to his lips. Shh. Flowey's grin fled. He blinked. He seemed at a loss. Then his smile returned again, thin and sharp. Oh, I get it. <laughs> Killing me isn't enough for you. You want to have some fun with me first, huh? His face molded itself into Asgore's rotted visage. Maybe you want to get revenge for that useless king? It smoothed into Frisk's own features. Or maybe... The eyes popped open, full of darkness. You're just a lot sicker than you look! Frisk had reached the throne room. The last vestiges of sunlight lay warm on his skin. Birds were singing. Flowers were blooming. He looked up at the cave ceiling and still couldn't see the sky. He had always wondered where the light came from. The stones up there held a quartz-like gleam. It was possible that the sun down here was only a reflection of what came from the surface. The golden flowers grew thick. The air was ripe with their scent. Boy, King Asgore sure did care about these flowers. Definitely more than he cared about his subjects, am I right? They'll probably be glad he's dead. Flowey's usual twisted chirpness was coming back, but it was an uphill battle. His gaze still darted this way and that, and his smile wavered around its outline, as though he had to make a serious effort to keep it in the right shape. Frisk could feel roots squirming like worms against his palm. The antechamber and the bridge stood empty. The monsters had dispersed and gone to await news of victory or defeat. Frisk pushed the elevator's call button with the hilt of the knife and stepped in when it arrived. He stood quietly in place with Flowey held at one side. Flowey kept surreptitiously glancing at Frisk's face for any sign of his intentions. Judging by the way his scowl got a little deeper every time he looked, he wasn't finding much success. Frisk walked down the hall, up the stairs. On the steps he could see numerous footprints, claw marks, and suspicious stains where the monsters had trooped up and out. Asgore's house stood empty. The only sound was the tick of an unseen clock. It's a nice place, right? Flowey observed. And no one's ever gonna live here again. Hey, it could be worse. If you hadn't killed him, then he would have just lived here by himself. Forever. You know, like she's doing. Frisk carried him to the kitchen and carefully placed the knife on the counter. Then he opened the oven door. Flowey's grin fell so far it almost literally dropped off his face, sliding down to his petals. Whoa, 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 wait, uh, don't do anything crazy. Frisk pulled out the oven rack. You go all this time without hurting a single person and now you're going to do this to me? What's wrong with- Frisk pulled out the pie tin, replaced the rack, shut the door. He slid the handful of dirt and flowey into the tin. He put the tin on the counter. He turned on the sink. He washed and dried his hands. He washed and dried the knife. Then he picked up the knife and the pie tin again and left the kitchen. Flowey now appeared to be thinking very hard of something to say. He'd grown himself a brow just so he could crease it. Now the bedroom. Frisk set the pie tin down on the right-hand bed amongst the menagerie of stuffed animals. He went over to the open box and put the knife back in. He closed the box back up as best he could. You're putting it back? Why are you putting it back? Who do you think's gonna come and get it? Hey, I'm talking to you! Flowey was making a game attempt to rock himself out of the pie tin, but by the looks of it, he was still too weak to do much more than feebly drape his roots over the tin's edge. 
Frisk imagined that's why he always made sure no one got too close. He was lightning quick so long as he could burrow, but get him off the ground and he was immobile as any other flower. Any other flower that could murder you with friendliness pellets. But that was off the table now, too. As another limp attack from Flowey proved, his latest projectile barely scorched the floor. Frisk picked the tin back up, now holding it in both hands so it wouldn't rock around as much. He left the house, took the elevator down to the core. Okay, Flowey said. Let's see what you're planning. But you'd better move quick, because... He slowly turned to face Frisk, his mouth full of dripping fangs. Once I get my strength back... Frisk wouldn't even meet his gaze. His nightmarish face turned irritated. He proceeded through the core, making sure to keep his distance from the sea of plasma. The heat was tremendous, even with Ice Wolf's diligent cooling efforts. He walked down the outer bridge and into the MTT Hotel lobby, where Meditan's glorious fountain statuary continued to violate both the carpet and nearly every safety code law known to monster kind. The usual crowd of monsters was clustered around the busted elevator to the capital. He saw several of them turn to him with wary eyes. Flowey noticed too, and tittered. Oh boy, here we go. I bet they're wondering if you're back from the fight. Whatever happened to their king? He turned again. Well, should we tell him? I'll shout it out loud as I can if you like. Ready? Frisk stared down at him, then held out the pie tin to the monsters. Flowey looked at them, then back at Frisk, then back to the monsters. Angry eyebrows appeared on his face. It's no fun if you're gonna let me. Frisk sighed and carried him out the front door. The elevator crowd watched them leave. As a slime, I'm puzzled, said a slime, who was puzzled. He walked down the steps. He waved to O1 and O2, who were, at the moment, practicing their synchronized bouncing. O2 was still a little behind, but not for lack of trying. The nice cream salesman hummed along to the jolly clatter of their armor. O1 and O2 waved back. Even that was in perfect unison. Their symmetrical camaraderie was fearsome to behold. He took the elevator to Hotland's bottom level. Alphys's lab wavered in the blistering air ahead. Flowey's expression turned sly, which was a totally expected emotion to appear on Flowey's face. Slyness on Flowey's face was a biannual vacation year, and it had a timeshare and knew where to find all the best restaurants. So you're taking me to Dr. Alphys? What, you think she's going to find a way to keep me trapped? <laughs> you really don't know anything, do you? She's not even... Frisk headed in the opposite direction. Oh. Uh, never mind. He stopped at the water cooler, poured a cup of water, then poured the cup into the pie tin. Then he poured another cup for himself, drank, flung the cup into the lava, and continued on. He avoided glancing at Flowey's face during all of this. He didn't miss much. Flowey was running out of ways to express bewilderment. Outside Hotland, the enormous marquee sign stained them both blood red. Frisk's footsteps echoed at an even pace. Flowey craned his head this way and that. This is where you fought Undyne, isn't it? And then you made friends with her. And then you burnt down her house. And then you killed her boss. He smirked. I wonder if she'll still want to be friends when she finds out you took away her home and her job. Maybe she can stay with Alphys? Oh, but wait. She was the royal scientist, wasn't she? So now she's got no job either. Wow, you ruined so many people's lives in just one day. Frisk kept walking. Stop ignoring me. The damp, cool air of Waterfall was soothing after the sizzling atmosphere of Hotland and the core. Water trickled down the walls, dripped from the ceiling, seeped up from unseen cracks in the floor. It all made its own quiet music, a distant patter, a quiet rhythm. On one loop, Sands had told him something that the water down here was so suffused with magic from the core's runoff that it actually ran uphill, falling down and then flowing back up against gravity, forever cycling through unseen capillaries in the stony flesh of Mount Ebbett. The ceaseless rain in the marsh's center wasn't really rain, but water from the marshes themselves, crawling up to the cavern's ceiling, only to fall down again. It felt like a taunt, another reminder that time here always stood still. 
Not even the water was allowed to move on. His shoes squelched through the tunnel, where the memory flowers bent low, perpetually whispering their passing conversations. At least one voice sounded like someone he knew. Someday, I'd like to climb the mountain we're all buried under. Standing under the sky, looking at the world all around. That's my wish. <laughs> hey, you said you wouldn't laugh. Sorry, it's just funny. That's my wish, too. He stood and waited until the conversation was done. Flowey spoke again, his voice unusually hushed. Can we go somewhere else, please? He walked past the plaques bearing the sordid history of the war, past the waterfalls that held his reflection. He maneuvered through the mushroom caverns, tapping each mushroom to refresh its cool blue bioluminescence as the room fell dark. Every time the light flared, Flowey had made a new horrifying face. Toriel half-melted with bone exposed, a shifting mass of vegetable meat bearing remnants of everyone he knew, dripping fangs open wide and ready to close on his throat. After the third complete failure to get a reaction, he settled on a sulky pout for the rest of the trip. They stepped back out into the light. In the distance was a joyful chorus of, Hoy! I'm Timmy! Flowey swiveled up to Frisk, his expression haunted. Frisk shook his head. Flowey looked relieved. They approached another crossroads. To the right, Frisk could hear Gerson tidying up his shop. He occasionally went wah-ha-ha -ha for no reason at all. He was a fascinating character. What? So where are you taking me? You think that so-called hammer of justice is going to keep me in line? What a joke. Even the king had more of a spy than he did. That old fool's only accomplishment is living so long that everyone forgot what a failure he was. His face warped into a turtle's twisted beak. All I have to do is wait till his back is turned and then... Frisk headed in the opposite direction. All right, quit messing with my head! Where are we going? Down the steps, where the river person hunched over their vessel, their hooded head turned to Frisk when they saw him approach. Tra-la-la, -la. there you are. I was starting to think you wouldn't show. The river person had a voice like a bass beat, pleasant and musical in its way, but hard to place. Frisk hopped on board and sat down with the pie tin in his lap. He waved. The river person did not wave back, but that wasn't their fault. It was still a bit of a mystery how many limbs they actually had under the cloak. So... Shall we go where you requested? Frisk nodded. The river person faced forward. Then we're off. Tra-la-la. -la. The boat rocked away from the stones, then glided down the underwater river. The trip, as always, was a smooth one. Soft blue light seeped in from crystal deposits in the walls, from the funnels of magically charged water. Frisk idly drummed on the edge of the pie tin. Flowey snapped at him to cut it out. Frisk stopped drumming. Tra-la-la. -la. Think of something beautiful really hard, and maybe you will see it tomorrow. Then, a diversion. The boat jerked in the water and headed down a side tunnel, far more cramped than the main river. The river person had to hunch a bit as they sailed through the darkness. These waters are unfamiliar and quite turbulent. Do be safe. They exited into the marshland, where the concentrations of magic were especially high. The water shimmered, cobalt, and every ripple sent up motes of light like fireflies. It was as though they were sailing through a field of stars. Frisk's face glowed as he took in the sight. Flowey looked extraordinarily bored. The boat came to rest on a mud bank. Frisk stood up and waved goodbye. Until next time... Tra-la-la. -la. He hopped off and carried Flowey through the marsh and into the canal where Onion-san dwelled. Onion-san rose from the water, smiling. Onion-san saw Flowey's molten glare. Onion-san sank beneath the water, smiling. Past Shiren's makeshift concert hall, avoiding Undyne's dastardly piano puzzle. And at last he found himself in front of the strange horned statue hunched and huddled under the umbrella Frisk had placed in its hand. The music box secreted in its base played without end. Now Frisk remembered. This was the melody Toriel would hum after teaching him. 
He stood with Flowey close to his chest, listening to the song patter its notes like raindrops. You know, Flowey said thoughtfully, I'm feeling much better. Vines burst from the pie tin and coiled around Frisk like snakes. They squeezed his chest tight enough to make his ribs groan. They cut an angry red rash across his throat. They seized his arms and lifted the pie tin up to his face. Flowey's head inflated into a grin with teeth like tombstones. Frisk showed no change of expression whatsoever, not even when white pellets popped out of the air and encircled his neck ready to close in. I want to make a bet, Flowey said. He swayed in the tin like a cobra. I bet that if I kill you really super quick, I can grab your soul before you even get a chance to reset. Then I can head up to the surface and have all the fun I want. I'll even be real nice and only kill you once. I've done it plenty of times today already, don't you think? He leaned in even closer. It smelled like dirt and decaying vegetables. Of course, I'll pay a visit to all your friends before I leave. And before they die, I'll let them know it's your fault. Then do it. Flowey almost flinched. Frisk's words were toneless and low. Maybe, Frisk added, you've done it already. Flowey's mouth twitched. <laughs> you can't fool me. I'm not affected by your resets, remember? I don't forget anything. You're right, you don't. The vine around Frisk's throat squeezed tighter, but the words kept coming anyway. Not unless I'm trying really hard. It... it doesn't work that way! Frisk said nothing more. He turned his attention back to the statue. The music box's song filled the silence between them. After a long moment, the vines loosened, uncoiled, and retracted into the pie tin. Flower's entire body seemed to shrink. Just tell me where we're going already, he muttered. Not much further. Down the tunnel, there was a bucket of umbrellas. Frisk took one, as the sign politely requested, fumbled with it one-handed, and eventually popped it open. He continued into the center of Waterfall, where the rain fell. To the best of his knowledge, this was the only place in the underground where it rained. The ceiling overhead was so seamed, cracked, and pitted that those hidden rivers streaming through Ebbets seeped out, and the result was an unceasing drizzle that bubbled around the stones like a secret, before the water was sapped back into the mountain to begin its journey all over again. Frisk's every footstep created small ripples in the film of water on the ground. Flowey practiced his faces in every puddle they passed. The reeds in the surrounding mud bent over the path like eavesdroppers. He stepped out into the central cavern, where the thick dark mud stretched all the way into hot land. If you had the nerve to actually brave the murky land, Frisk had never dared, he was just too short, You'd find the ground gradually turning hard and cracked as the magma crept closer and baked it into pottery. But out here, the air was cool and damp. A single rocky path through the outer edge of the marsh, and Frisk's footsteps splashed across it as he walked. Small ponds rippled and heaved in the swamp, making it look as though the whole cavern was taking slow, shallow breaths. Overhead, the crystals embedded in the ceiling sparkled like an overturned jewel box, the closest thing to a starry night sky the monsters had ever seen, their position forever unchanging. Asgore's castle glittered in the darkness on the far edge of the cavern, the silky light here turning all its turrets sapphire. Frisk set Flowey down and sat on the edge of the path, his shoes hanging over the swamp. He winced a little as cold water seeped through his shorts. He kept the umbrella held over them both. That's it? Flowey looked around. That's it. Why here? I like it here, Frisk said. He stared out at the castle. I came here with a friend once. What, the armless freak with a crush on Undyne? That's right. Do you know their name? I never ask. Yeah, I do, and I'm not telling you. Okay. Flowey's face warped in rage once more. Then he looked back at the view, the castle in the distance, the points of light overhead, and little by little, he arranged himself into a more neutral shape. I'm not impressed, he said. I've been here a hundred times. I've been everywhere a hundred times. What, did you think taking me here would make us friends? 
Frisk said nothing. It's all fake, you know. Those aren't real stars, they're just rocks. This isn't real rain. That's not even a real castle, because now it's got no king. And even when he wasn't dead, dead because of you, it's not like he ever helped anyone. He could have just stayed in that stupid garden of his forever, and nothing would have changed. He glanced sideways at Frisk. You know, it seems to me that you've got this entire place down by heart already. How much time have you spent down here? How much longer before you get as bored as me? He grinned. You know the funniest part? Right now, there's only two people in the whole world who will never understand how you feel. And both of them hate your guts. His insults ran once again into Frisk's wall of silence and broke. His grin wilted. Why do I even bother? Flowey sighed and turned his gaze back to the swamp. There's only one person out there I won't get tired of. It sure isn't you. You're the most boring person I've ever met. And even then, I couldn't really care about them. He shook his head. Why am I telling you all this? I'm a good listener. Was that a joke? I don't know. Was it funny? Oh, ha ha! His root bed writhed. Can I go now? It's not like either of us have anything better to do. Not since you wrecked my plan. He smiled. I'll just have to kill time until you reset again. Then we can do it all over. Frisk's head turned, just enough so that one heavy-lidded eye raised on Flowey. His bedraggled hair curled around his face. He looked exhausted. He said, Can I ask you something? No. Okay. Fine. Flowey snapped. Ask me then! You really do want to leave, right? And go to the surface? Flowey's face reverted into its most basic shape. Straight line mouth, two dot eyes. Possibly because he was too dumbstruck to attempt anything more complex. That, he said slowly, is the single stupidest thing I've heard anyone say ever. What the hell do you think? I didn't steal all those souls and kill you over and over again for fun. He paused, then smiled. Well, not just for fun. So, if I found a way to break the barrier without hurting anyone and leave with all the monsters, would you come with me? For a long time, the only sound was the gossip of the rain. There's no way to do that anymore, Flowey said. Not without the souls. You know better. Frisk's eyes bore into him. I could, if I wanted to. Flowey blinked. For a moment, his expression seemed almost wistful. <laughs> that voice. It kind of reminds me of someone. Then he shook his head, stiffened his stem in rage. You don't understand anything about me. You can't just toy with me like that like you did with all the other idiots down here. I'm better than them. His eyes turned sunken. His mouth grew fangs. You'd get to see what they were really like if they could just remember what I did. Do you have any idea how many times I've messed with all of them? Do you have any idea how many times I've killed them all? Every single one. Again. And again! If you had any idea, they'd be happy to kill me on sight. Because as you keep failing to understand, you idiot... That's the way the world works! Frisk's face didn't even twitch. And stop looking at me like that! Flowey shouted. It's pissing me off! Frisk looked away and waited until the sound of Flowey's grinding teeth ceased. He said, You're right. Of course I'm right! It, about what? I don't understand you. Rain dripped off the shaking umbrella. I'm trying, and I think I might have learned something new. What, that you're a selfish brat with too much time and not enough brains? I'm not going to kill anyone. I won't let anyone kill me either. And I know I'm not the person you want me to be. He looked over at Flowey again. But as long as you need someone to play with, I'll be around until you're ready to leave. Flowey shrank back from his gaze. He huddled in the pie tin. His features shifted like fog. 
Why? The rain whispered. Why are you being so nice to me? Frisk remained motionless for a while. Then, inch by inch, he transferred the umbrella to his other hand and rooted around in his pockets. There was a crinkling of paper. He withdrew the paper he had drawn of Asriel, unfolded it, and held it up in front of Flowey. Flowey stared at the picture. He tilted his head. His expression turned confused. Then, gradually, his features softened. He leaned in closer to the picture, his head crafting into Asriel's smiling face. Frisk started to smile, too. His cheeks hurt a little from the effort. That was when Flowey's head jerked up to meet his, his grin feral and his eyes two burning holes. Pellets encircled Frisk's wrists and snapped shut like handcuffs. He cried out in pain and dropped both the umbrella and the picture. As the umbrella rolled away and he nursed his burning skin, Flowey howled with laughter into the air and fired bullet after bullet into the paper until it was nothing more than sodden scraps, indistinct, transparent, washed away, already gone. You idiot! He cackled. That's what this is all about? Him? Did she tell you about him when she was tucking you in at night? That'd make for one sad bedtime story. Frisk looked down at his shuddering hands. His wrists were covered in angry red welts. I bet she did. You must have reminded her of him in so many ways. But hey, but hey, you want to know how that story ends? The minute he poked his head out into the real world, he got exactly what he deserved. He died, all by himself, in the dark, crying out for anyone to save him. Flowey's whole face blackened, and his voice dropped into a grinding rasp. But nobody came. So keep that in mind next time you trot out your worthless, useless, pathetic sympath- With expert timing and precision, an especially fat raindrop had fallen down and hit Flowey right in the eye. His wicked expression fled, and he shook his head back and forth, trying to shake the water out. Already his petals were drenched, and the pie tin was overflowing. Frisk looked up from his injuries. He reached out for the umbrella, and, though his burned hands screamed from the effort, held it over Flowey, keeping him dry. Flowey looked up at Frisk, eyes hollow. He sagged. I can't understand you at all. Frisk kept his distance now. He was outside, the umbrella's radius now, and rainwater turned his hair into a ragged mass of brown clumps that hung to his face like river silt. Flowey looked lost in thought. Sorry for ruining your picture, he said. I got carried away. Frisk stared out over the water. I, uh, can make it up to you if you want. What if I told you I knew some way to get you a better ending? Frisk's hand tightened on the umbrella's handle, despite the pain. Flowey didn't seem to notice. He kept talking. You'll have to load your save file and, well, in the meantime, why don't you go see Dr. Alphys? It seems like you could have been better friends. He looked hopeful. Who knows? Maybe she's got the key to your happiness. Frisk set the umbrella down. He picked up the pie tin, then tilted it so Flowey and his clawed of dirt slid out. Flowey's roots dug into solid stone. He wriggled in place as though he was trying to get cozy. He smiled wide at Frisk. See you soon, he said, and disappeared into the earth. Frisk didn't bother picking up the umbrella again. He looked out at the swamp, hands in his lap, water coursing cleanly down his face. He didn't look at the false stars. He made no wishes. He stayed there for a long time. And... All the while, the rain kept falling in the same place, in the same places, as it always would and always had before. Again. Always the same place, the same thing. He was in the ruins again, sitting against the pillar with his knees pulled up to his chin. Toriel had given him the phone and then left, told him to stay and wait for her, she never showed up and never would, another constant. He would have to go and look for her eventually. No rush, there was always time. The phone rang at regular intervals, first reassurance, then worry, then dogs. He remembered every one. He kept a tally in his mind. 
Eventually, the calls would stop coming and he'd have some peace. He was certain that if he just sat there for another hundred years or so, everything would be fine. Ring, ring. Another call. Maybe Toriel had retrieved her phone after all. Maybe she'd come and pick him up. He could draw a new picture. He wouldn't let anyone else see it this time. That had been a mistake. This time he'd do better. Ring, ring. He picked up the phone off the ground, putting it to his ear. Click. And what he heard widened his eyes, straightened his back, and filled him with determination. I found him. Long Before King Asgore's royal scientist had been hired for his genius, not his interior decorating skills. This was evident from a single glance at the Corps' laboratory, all pitted linoleum and sharp right angles and dark gray metal, even when it was first constructed. It had already looked a hundred years old. The ventilation fans buzzed like cicadas. The sleeping quarters were in a completely illogical central chamber that was full of drafts and foot traffic. The elevators moved along strange vectors that made the riders feel small and uncertain about their place in the universe. The break room's videotapes were always strangely sticky. And the lights, and this was especially dangerous, flickered from time to time thanks to the power draw in observation. It had been a while since the last accident, but for obvious reasons, Sands wasn't about to take any chances. This was why he'd secreted himself in one of the side offices near the freezers, where the power draw was more stable and rigged up lamps off the central power grid for good measure. To say he was surrounded by reading material would be accurate but insufficient. Insonced, or possibly entombed, would be better. Ragged textbooks formed corridors and parapets and precariously wobbling towers all throughout the office. It was unknown if you could construct a flying buttress out of notebooks, but the stacks were making a good try of it. The scritch of San's pencil could be heard over the buzz of the lights. Uh, okay, something else on wave particle contrasts. That goes here. And I guess we gotta maybe find another thing on photons next. This stuff needs a name. Maltemporology? Chronomalacia? <laughs> oh man, that's a good one. Put that one in the books. Knock, knock, knock. Yeah? Come on in, Alphys. The door creaked open. Uh, hi, Sans. Uh, how did you know it was me? Oh my god, where did you ever get all these? You know how it is. They sort of multiply on their own after a while. And if it was the dock knocking, then the sound would have been about six feet higher up. Come on, follow my voice, and, uh, watch where you step. Tentative shuffling could be heard through the stacks. Alphys's orange snout peeked gingerly around a wobbling pile of engineering manuals. I, uh, just wanted to let you know, I heard the oven ding in the kitchen, where the oven is. Oh, great, thanks for the heads up. Means my quiche is ready. Your what? My quiche. Oh, Oh, sorry, I, I, I misheard. I love those. A rustle as she got out her phone. Um, how, how do you spell that again? It's a casserole, Alpheus. They're good for you. The doc loves them when he can actually remember to eat. Sans set aside his pencil. I figured I'd try to drag him out of observation before he wastes away to bones and skinnier bones. He stepped around his desk and met Alphys in a papery courtyard, hands in his pockets. In defense to his work, he was wearing a lab coat. In defense to the fact that he was Sans, he was also wearing house slippers. They were approximately the same height, but Alphys managed to hunch herself shorter anyway. She smiled nervously. It, uh, it actually smells really nice. I thought I'd make something on my own, uh, too, so we could all eat to, uh, t together for a change. Is it, uh, ramen? No! She reconsidered. Yes, but but it, it's the gourmet stuff. It, real meat and everything. Cool. Come on, let's get out of here. Baby steps. I think some of the essays are restless. He tiptoed around the paperwork and out into the hall. Sans instinctively glanced up at the lights. You, uh, checked the grid, right? Yep. Everything's running fine, which is good because that's the rules. <laughs> Always stay in the light if you were alone, even when you were asleep, especially then. 
Alphys had made it clear to Sans that she was totally okay with this guideline pasted on the walls every two dozen steps. She didn't think it was ominous at all. Sans hadn't said anything, because Alphys had told him this was completely unprompted, with a pronounced twitch under her eye. This place really didn't agree with her. He'd tried, with decreasing levels of subtlety, to convince her to leave, but she was having none of it, and getting a word from the doctor on the matter was a lost cause. She'd apparently approached Asgore personally with a request to work with the royal scientist, and said royal scientist had apparently managed to get his brain and his fingers lined up long enough to sign off on the request. Sans could understand up to a point. The girl was a sizzling bundle of nerves, but put her in front of a machine, any machine, and she'd work that kind of magic that even monsters would have trouble believing. And they needed someone to perform maintenance. Observation was just sucking up too much power, even this close to the core. The lights couldn't go out again. It, uh... It'd be really nice for all of us to get together for a change, you know? Her tail dragged on the linoleum as she walked. Just, just, you know, off the record. I wasn't expecting it to be quite like this. It's re really, uh, empty. Yeah, well, you know. He tried to leave it at that, but Alphys soldiered on. I, I mean, there's lots of beds in the sleeping area. A, a lot of beds. A and most of them don't look like they've been slept in for a while. I nap pretty much anywhere, and the doc seems to think sleep is a thing that happens to other people. As for everyone else, they've, you know, passed on. To other jobs. Place is a little gloomy, in case you didn't notice. I'm mainly sticking around because I promised the doc I'd help him out. Someone's gotta translate his notes. Most everyone else has families they want to see. Oh, I get it. I, uh, don't have that problem. <laughs> She tugged at her lab coat and grinned in an unsettling way. They stopped in front of the central elevator. Sans hit the call button. A deep thrum reverberated in the walls. What's the doctor doing in there anyway? You, if you don't, uh, mind me asking. Sorry, Alphys, it's hush-hush. Another reason why everyone left, you know? Gets a little frustrating not being able to brag about your job. He rocked back and forth on his heels. Even me. I got a brother back in the capital. He thinks I'm studying to be a dentist. This elevator really took its sweet time. Won't matter for much longer, anyway. Research is moving on. Asgore's more interested in soul properties than our current project, so the whole thing will be shut down as soon as he figures out a polite enough way to ask. Oh, I wanted to tell you. I actually found some of the doctor's blueprints. I hope that's okay. Sans looked at her. She timidly tapped her claws together. And, you know, at least for the ones I could actually read, there's some really good ideas in there. I might be able to put something together that'll make Asgore happy. So you can continue your research. Oh. Sans stared. Huh. <laughs> That's nice. I'm sure the doc will be impressed. With blessed good timing, the elevator dinged open, bathing them in a cold white light. Sands stepped in. Take my food out of the oven, would you? By the time I drag the dock up here, it should have cooled off. Ch sure thing. And, uh, Sands. She sidled a little closer to the elevator. Is everything okay? Things here seem really uh, tense. Ah, we'll be fine. He winked as the elevator door slid shut. Do I look worried? He held the wink until the doors finally closed and the elevator jerked to life. Then he calmly turned around, rested his head against the cool metal wall, and took several deep, shuddering breaths. It was stressful enough having to cobble together an entirely new branch of science with nothing but waterlogged textbooks from the surface. The atmosphere in the place wasn't helping at all. Papyrus and his endless procession of action figures were a soothing bomb whenever he managed to slip away and get home, but right now, leaving the doctor alone didn't seem like the smartest idea. It had started as a study to find new ways to break the barrier, because of course it did. The monster community had one problem on its mind, and no one was keen on waiting for who knew how long until another human fell down with a soul to claim. The doctor had overseen the construction of the core just to generate enough power to find a solution. For what, exactly, Sans was never quite sure, 
but the man was the royal scientist for a reason. Much like this elevator, his mind tended to move in weird directions, but it had always reached the same destination in the end. As a matter of fact, the elevator currently felt like it was traveling diagonally. The core was completed. The lab was built. The early experiments had been tentative things, sending out feelers, mapping unfamiliar ground. Most of them had worked with souls before and after. And they were spooky things when you got right down to it, the way those jarred lights seemed to swivel to face you when your back was turned. It had been around the time the doctor had sketched out the blueprints for a number of machines, including the skull-shaped thing that made Sansa's calcium crawl when he'd tried to read it. Keyword being, tried. Even if you discounted the doctor's handwriting, attempting to work from his blueprints was like baking a cake on a pogo stick. It was exhausting, it was pointless, and it would probably end in a big mess and a lot of embarrassing self-injury. Then, strange readings on the monitors. Oscillations that leapt like fleas. Persistent deja vu. The doctor had built deeper into the core and begun observation. This was when the rest started happening. Pockets of space where the air was oddly cold. The sound of laughter and scraping metal. The feeling of always being watched. And then, the accidents. The elevator doors finally opened. Sands stepped out, his grin back in fine form. The floor in observation was riddled with holes like a cheese grater. Better to let in the core's warmth. They needed as much power as possible. Through the holes crept a dull orange glow. The heat was tremendous. They were just above the core, or possibly inside it, or possibly both at once. Bizarre things started happening to time and space when the instruments here were on, and the doctor never turned them off anymore. The lab was vast and stretched out into blackness, machines scattered without attention to sense of safety, printers that gradually scratched out the oscillations, monitors with their keyboards dangling several yards away, the screens full of darkness, scattered tables bearing lit candles, photographs, urns. Sands carefully avoided looking at these memorials as he walked across the glowing floor. A voice could be heard at the far end, low, breathless, thin as spider's legs, wandering from claws to claws as though the speaker was constantly forgetting and then remembering again what he wanted to say. A fearsome phenomenon. What a lovely helix. Everything that descends must converge, I believe. This model will bear a bitter fruit. Hey, WD, Sans called. It's Sans. You want to step over here for a second? Yes, Sans. It is you. You are there. But I am here. This disparity must be rectified. Sans groaned and kept walking. Grinning through the dark at the lab's furthest end were numerous lines of color, as if looking through a cracked window with an aura on the other side. They zigzagged, they crossed, they went parallel again, they crept in from every direction. This sight was, in fact, generated by numerous monitors, haphazardly stacked on top of one another. After every accident, this monolith had grown larger and the power draw greater. Sans had wanted to quit after the first one. Finding a pile of dust where one of your co-workers used to sleep kind of knocked the wind out of you. But the doctor had just grown more determined after that, and with everyone that followed. They'd instated the policy about the lights far too late. And by then, the power draw had increased to the point where their own machines worked against them. Alphys and her nimble, sweaty hands were at least keeping the grid up and the machines topside maintained, but there was no guarantee if that would keep them safe. Hello, my little anomaly. Hello, my terrible terminus. I see you. I am standing in your way. I will terminate you. Like the terminal tumor you are, I will exorcise and exorcise my excision. Ha <laughs> ha. My wit is sharp. My math is sharper. Talk like this is why he needed Sans around. The doctor dispensed pearls of wisdom like a vending machine, but somewhere between his mind and his mouth, they came out covered in nightmares. He'd once given a brief lecture on comparative soul metaphysics without Sans there to interpret him. Everyone in attendance had supposedly slept with a nightlight for a month afterward. He loomed through the shadows now, his exposed bones and lab coat making him appear like a child's sketch in chalk. Incredibly tall, 
Apparently Sans had caught the short end of the stick there, pun most definitely intended. Papyrus was already lanky as anything, and his older brother looked like someone had taken Papyrus and shoved him into a taffy puller. And that went double for his hands, which had palms like dishes and fingers like ten spindly bananas. They popped, they clattered, they never quite agreed on how to act. This behavior might have explained his handwriting, which wasn't illegible so much as approaching legibility from the totally wrong direction. He stood in front of the monitors now, with those hands splayed out, like a schizophrenic conductor with ten tiny batons. The snarl of lines in front of him, Sans noticed, formed an irregular pattern as they approached the center. They converged and formed a helix, a spiral that seemed almost three-dimensional in a way that made his sockets water. And in the center, darkness. Darker than dark, a black blob whose edges wavered like a jellyfish and sucked all the timelines in. Hey, WD, he said. Nice to see the work's going well. You want to maybe get something to eat before you pass out? He stuck his shaking hands in his pockets. Got a quiche with your name all over it. That's not a joke, by the way. I had to be really careful arranging the spinach. The hands reached out to a pair of nearby keyboards. Keys rattled like machine gun fire. The dark blob seemed to tremble. A different differential, a bit of pressure, and we will pierce right through. This relentless future finally looks brighter and brighter. With every word, his hands shuddered and clacked, moving in impulsive yet predictable patterns. He was never able to talk without gesturing. It was like his mouth and his hands moved on the same switch. Come here, man. Sans shivered involuntarily. It felt like he was being watched. This can wait. Get some food in that ribcage. Alphys cooked something, too, in case you want to get your weak sodium intake in one sitting. Darker. Yet darker. The darkness keeps growing. The shadows cutting deeper photon readings. Negative. WD, hey! Sans whistled through his teeth. My face is in this direction! He started at that, as though hearing Sans for the first time, and glanced over his shoulder. There were dark circles under his dark circles. This next experiment seems very, very interesting. He turned around fully after that, slightly hunched, his hands at his sides. The glow coming from beneath the floor stained his bones a faint orange. Clipped to his lab coat was a plastic badge with a smiling skull next to the words Dr. W.D. Gaster, Royal Scientist. He stood with his back to the monitors. Every candle blew out. Every alarm was strangled. Every printer began to spew out page after page of nines. Only Sans saw the dark patch twitch and surge until it engulfed the entire monitor on which it clung. Only Sans saw how it seemed to bleed darkness, the shadow running so thick that they crept down and hacked the timelines below into hash. Only he saw the arm emerge from the blackness, dripping shadows like tar, and the hand at the end of that arm, and the knife clutched by his hand, its blade gleaming a bloody red. Only Sans saw the knife rise. What? said Dr. Gaster. Do you two think? And fall. To be continued.